Good afternoon, folks. Mike Nicodema here from Greenberg Traurig's Equine Industry Law Group. We're here at the seventh chucker uh, of the beautiful National Polo Center in Wellington, Florida. Uh, welcome to the latest edition of the Minute with Mike podcast, where we discuss legal and business issues that are important to all equestrians. I have two wonderful guests here today. Both are, both are iconic in equine sports and in the Wellington horse community. I have to say, when I woke up this morning, I had to pinch myself knowing that I was able to get these two men who are so busy on my show at the same time on the same day, but I did it. Now, my first guest is, I don't know how do I say this. He, he's the consummate businessman. He's a very successful entrepreneur and his name is synonymous with polo in the United States and probably the world. And I'm going to read you some of his accolades because there are many, and I'll just want to give you a snapshot. He's the co-founder of the famous Outback Steakhouse restaurant franchise. He is the recipient of the Florida Restaurant Association's Lifetime Achievement Award. His polo teams have won three, not one, not two, but three U.S. Open Polo Championships. He's a member of the Polo Hall of Fame. And he's the chairman of NPCs, the National Polo Center's Hospitality Operations Inc. organization, where he focuses on reinvigorating the club's offerings with his extensive experience in the food service industry. Please welcome Mr. Tim Gannon. How are you, Tim? Very good. Great th to thank you for that introduction. <laughs> the only thing I have to do is tell you five U.S. Opens. Five U.S. <laughs> opens. Oh, okay. When we did our Almost first in a row. When we did our first podcast, yeah, I right. think I got that right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And my, ne my next guest is an, is an equally impressive businessman. And he's a stalwart advocate of equestrian sports in Wellington and frankly, for that matter, across the world. Let me read you some of this man's achievements. He's the former Secretary General of the International Equestrian Federation, FEI, the governing body for equestrian sports. He came on the Wellington scene in 2008, has been here ever since. He is known for his dawn to dusk worth eth ethic. And this is, this is not something every businessman can handle, a cool and steady hand when dealing with the most thorniest of business issues. He's the president of Wellington International, uh, for my money, the winner equestrian capital of the world. Please welcome Mr. Michael Stone. Thanks, Mike. Mike, it's great meeting you. So we'll be talking uh, with Tim and Michael today about their respective venues, um, how they bring value to the, to the equine world and the community here in Wellington, the business issues and challenges they've faced over the years, and their visions for the future and their hopes and dreams for how these venues can continue to provide value and thrive and grow in the years to come. So gentlemen, you're very busy men. Uh, you have a lot on your plate every day. And, and let's start there. Let's start with the season. During the season, I live down here full time, so I know things are real hectic during the season. I can only imagine what they're like for you, for you gentlemen. So let's start with Michael. What's a typical day in the life of Michael Stone during, during the equestrian season in Wellington? Well, one of the things I like the best about about my my job here is that no day is really typical, but it starts pretty early in the morning, um, working out whatever issues there are to get the show horse show going, because we show from uh, Tuesday is a, a practice day and goes right through to Sunday evening, and most of my job is in making sure everything is operating smoothly for all our different groups, whether it's sponsors, vendors riders, mainly riders, because they're the people who drive the whole business. And it's uh, pretty much dawn to dusk and um, every day bar Mondays. Mondays are the one day off uh, for almost everybody in Wellington. Yeah, that, that, that's kind of unique that Monday is a day off for, for the riders and trainers in equestrian sports, but I don't think it's your day off. Ah, I try and take some time off on Mondays. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, Tim. I know you're a busy man. When I come to the Polo Club, you're always here. No matter when I'm here, you are here. What's a typical day for you at, at MPC during the season? Well, similar to, to Mike's uh, observation is every day is a different day. Um, we'll have, we had one day, we had a wedding, uh, a, a, a bit of a, a remembrance funeral. We had a birthday party, a gala, all happening at the same time. And that's that's what's exciting is that this club means so much 
to our members and they the, we are the they choose us to have their galas we've raised three four five million dollars this year already for um for charities for spinal cord injury for uh cancer survivors uh we we just had the polo for life group that was here uh on friday night sold out and all of these events are sold out uh we had on monday we had a fashion show with veronica baird so you know it's it's a little bit of everything for everyone and it's and it's fun i find it all very exciting very thrilling and and i'm used to feeding people now the season when the season ends things are a little different here the the air is kind of different you know the population dies down i can get out of my community go to work a little easier uh, maybe you can get into favorite restaurant that you would take two months to get in during the season, but but it's great down here during the season. Does it change for you guys during the season? How about you, Tim? You you mean during off season? Yeah, during yeah. off season. During off season, that's really um, the work that you can't see is the real important work, the work of booking events and bringing, making sure next year is set up with speaker series, wine dinners, um, the maintenance of the facility, all the things that are not immediately apparent to you are the things you're working on so it's it's challenging because you got a little you got to dig below the surface a little bit to, to you got to go visit other clubs find out what they're doing find out what reciprocals can be made with the guards club in in england and and maybe in paris you know with we want to stay connected to the olympics and what's going on with that so you know it, it's uh it's a challenging time um, because, but your success of the winter is based on what you do in the summer. Sure, sure. I, I, I'm going to guess the, the answer is similar, Michael. Yeah, absolutely. Just as Tim said, our success this time of year is based on all the stuff we do during the, during the off season. We, we're sort of slightly different because we run for 40 weeks of the year, some sort of horse show. And increasingly we're finding the shoulder periods are growing because more people realize well, A, the quality of the competition here is great, but also they, the weather isn't actually as bad as people think. I mean, it's hot and it doesn't cool down, but it's hot almost everywhere in the U.S. in the summertime. And so more and more riders are staying here. They're living here longer. So not only are we trying to keep upgrading the facility as we go along and planning and organizing um, the 2025 season, we're also running these horse shows as well. So... It also means that we can keep a lot of staff full time, which has always been a struggle in any seasonal industry. I'm sure Tim would agree. That's one of the hardest things. If you're not operating at full, full pace, you just can't have as many people because you can't afford to keep them in the off season. Sure. And, and, and I, th I think Tim had it right. It's that work, it's that foundational work you, you guys do in the off season that sets the stage for the magic that happens during the season. And that kind of brings me to my next topic. Uh, you know, as as a horse owner and horse lover myself and my wife, you know, we we, we are just taken with the page, pageantry, the magic of coming here. I mean, the stadium seating almost looks like you're you're in the Roman Coliseum and watching a polo match, or going to our uh, you know table at the Blue Ribbon Club and watching a five star at at Wellington International. It just looks so grand. It just looks so wonderful and easy. And all, all as patrons, as customers, all we have to do is enjoy it. And it's so free and easy, but it's not free and easy. And there's a lot of work in it. I'm sure there's a lot of team effort involved in it. And uh, how, how does it work? How does it all happen, Michael? Well, in our case, we have a great team. And we've broken down into horse show operations and event operations. Under the horse show operations, we have a, a group of managers who, who organize that side of it. And then for the event uh, operations, they handle almost everything else, security, hospitality, um, all the different events that we do during the season, the VIP, um, lots of different managers. It's a lot. We employ about 530 to 560 people during season. Wow. So it's a big operation managing all that. And it's because we run, we run I mean, Paula, you run a lot of, uh, you know, during the week as well. And you have the club full time. We have the horse show full time, so it's it's similar, but uh, have more people competing every week. And, and Tim, there's a lot of magic magic that goes on here in NPC because I I come to matches all the time, and I always see you walking around. You're never sitting. 
you're always talking to someone, you're always doing something, you can see the wheels turning and, and you, you're trying to get things done. How does that, how does it happen here? Cause you come here and six, 800 people for a match on, on, um, on Sunday and it just looks easy, but it's not. Easy, It's not, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, smiling through the apocalypse, um, is kind of sometimes how you have to do it. You, you know, sometimes the lift station for the toilets backs up right in the middle. Some, I mean, crazy stuff happens when you have a stadium uh, that holds a thousand people. You're doing 600 for brunch. Uh, you're doing 600 over here for brunch all at the same time. And we got kitchens that are very tiny, very small, very uh, just like our staff. We're, we're handicapped a little bit with not full time people part-time people, people that just come on Sundays and you got to train them in one hour how to, how to work a stadium. So it's challenging, but you know, that's the fun of it. You know, that's, you, you make everybody, you know, put a smile on and, and do the best you can with hospitality. Thank God I'm, I don't, I don't have, uh, I'm only in charge of hospitality so I can focus on, you know, the champagne, the bubbles that keep the champagne cold and, and the hot dogs hot. So, um, it's a focused job and that's, and I've been doing it all my life, um, uh, food and beverage. So it comes pretty natural to me. Um, so I don't have to worry about polo operations, whether the field is too wet to play and all those that are taking care of the field or the stadium, uh, actually the getting, you know, 2000 people in and out of here in in 20, 30 minutes is, is very tricky. Uh, but it, that's all handled by the polo operations. We, you know, the good thing about, over here is the USPA bought this club. It's owned by polo players. It's run by polo players. I'm a polo player and a restaurateur. And the polo ops is Charles Smith, Hall of Famer. His father was one of the greatest 10 goalers, Cecil Smith, one of the greatest 10 goalers in the world. So we're all horse people. We all have this common thread that we actually get on the horse. We don't, you know, we're not racetrack people that buy a horse and cheer from the sidelines we are people that ride on the back of these animals and so that's an that's a very special joy and a very special privilege that 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 we that we have here well i can tell you tim the hospitality is working because when we come to a match here i don't know where you get the burgers from but i can smell them from the parking lot and it's <laughs> it's just intoxicating yeah it's, it's wonderful thanks Let, so let's talk about value value that your venues value that the, the these venues provide to the to the horse world and to the Wellington community, because during the season you come down here, I can't think of a place where there's more cultural diversity and and athletes coming from all over the world to play polo, show jumping, dressage, uh, uh, you know, hunters, and and it's it, it's just you know from the outside looking in, if you're not a horse person, you know, thankfully I am one. It's it maybe the value is not readily apparent, but I think there's tremendous value. And and Michael, let's start with you. How does your how does your venue, how do the equestrian sports that you, that uh, you put on there provide value not only to the uh, to the horse world but to the Wellington community? I think the we run the sports council every year to do um, an economic survey, mm. and uh, last year was something like three hundred and sixty million we generated for Palm Beach County. Wow. And okay. I'm sure Polo are very close to that as well because we're bringing in so many different people come into Wellington for that period. I think what it also does for the community is it maintains property values. So uh, anyone who lives in Wellington, their home has, has never suffered during any of the real recessions because there's such a demand for people to live here and be here. And I think thanks to the way the village of Wellington have managed the community, um, people can see the benefits. And I think just the fact that you're full on funders, you're full on family rights, and it's mainly local people, um, with increasingly, we, we're seeing more and more foreign people coming and actually buying homes here. But I think in general, it's the local community that benefits and with the income that we generate through uh, our joint operations is giving the money back to the village to improve the schools, the parks, the provide the facilities that Wellington makes Wellington such a great place. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. The Wellington, we moved down here three years ago from New York and never looked back and we won't look back. Tim, how about you? I mean, this place is historic. How does it provide 
value to you know support on the community. there there's magic here uh there's magic in this this place and the architecture the stadium um this polo field here hosted one of the most exciting polo matches i've seen in my 40-year history of watching polo last sunday with adolfo cambiasa the number one player in the world at 48 years old still number one in the world playing against his son number two in the world who's 20 years old and stealing the ball from his son in the last seconds and going down and scoring scoring and and really irritating his son like like no, no other but it was one of the most graceful elegant polo games it was polo at its best it was palermo style which is an open running game beautiful fluid liquid uh it was ballet it was pure ballet and um and i'm sure uh, you go over the jump and you see ballet all day all night with the beauty of those horses and and we did a um for the miami project we did a dressage exhibition um with with jan ebling and um and then we did uh which was gorgeous he he did it with a microphone and he explained dressage to everybody and he was exquisite and this horse was mesmerizing so that that was a great show then we had todd minicus uh come and do a jump off a six foot you know jumping straight up in the air doing an exhibition and then we followed that with a polo game i think what's what i look forward to uh working with michael is how do we combine our fans our sports the love of our horse and the understanding of these different disciplines that we have it's all it gets down to a shared uh love of of uh, of taking care of horses. We had last week, we had the trainer for the Bud, Budweiser Clydesdale horses oh, wow. that trained them how to kick the football at the commercial and how to all bow down at the same time at 9-11. Uh, I think he went over to visit everybody over at the jump show. And I think we're going to get him back next year with the Clydesdales to really show how he trains he's got a very special way of how he trains and puts these horses up on a block and gets their attention um where they're sus not suspended but they're above the ground and so you, they they have their attention and that's how he he learns to focus them on doing his commands it's quite in very soft very very soft uh animal lovers from all over the world would love his technique I like to i like i like to see a clydesdale do a meter 50. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen. And by, and by the way, I saw that match where Adolfo schooled his son. It yeah. was one of these, you're not ready for me yet, kid. That's right. <laughs> if you're going to get this, you're going to have to earn it. Yeah. You're not, there's no gift here. Exactly. So let's talk about the athletes a little bit, because I would imagine like in other sports, the, the athletes contribute significantly to the value. I mean, they're the talent. They're who everybody comes to see. Uh, how do you let's let's start with Tim on this one. How do you partner with the athletes, with the polo teams to help provide this value to the community and to the sport? Well, you know, what you do, you know, when you play polo and you play on a field like this and you've got crowds screaming, yelling, bands are playing, whatever, and you you have this jubilant audience. It, it, it's it's riveting if you're a polo player to play in, in on the number one field. We had all the the women uh, play here on a Friday Friday afternoon for the United States Women's Open. They were all thrilled to be on this field. Um, so we we offer the, a venue, a stage, and then we treat the stage and all the people that come to attend to support financially support, pay you know ten thousand dollars a year for these box seats to watch and support the game. Um, if polo has to be supported and by fans, the fans are the ones that support these polo guys. These horses are really expensive sure. and, um, the, the sport is expensive, just like over in the jumping world is it's all expensive. So you need sponsors. Then you got to make the sponsors happy and feel like they're getting value. The value component has to be very strong for the riders, quality of the field, uh, for the members, the quality of the service and food and the sponsors and the people that sponsor uh, Polo and make sure they're they're getting uh, a good return on their invested capital for marketing. That makes a lot of sense. And, and I would imagine the same is for you, Michael, at, at Wellington International. You have the best of the best riders from all over the world coming down 
for the season every year, uh, and, and you just watch them. I mean, we watch we watch them do the Grand Prix events. We watch them do the five stars. We're gonna go to the five star Saturday night, and and, and but your partners, you know, to provide entertainment for the fans, provide value to the community. How how does it work? How does it work for you? Yeah, it's very similar to, to the way Polo operates. We we work with the riders by providing what they need to bring their best horses to show and manage by giving away a lot of prize money. This year we give away nearly 14 million in, in prize money. And we set up the competitions in a way that they they want to compete. So like on, on Sunday, um, before the rain, thank God, um, the Olympic champion Ben Mayer won the Grand Prix in a, a fantastic uh, performance. So I think if you work with the riders and they're your partners, just the way the way Tim works w with the polo players, they respect you and they respect the organi both organizations that so we are trying to put on the best show we can. And it's never perfect, you know, there's always issues. And we have about two and a half thousand horses show every week, which is probably 2000 riders. So you're not gonna please all of them. At least nobody I've ever met has been able to please all of them. No. But if you can please the majority of them and they, they know we're all working together and I'm sure just like uh, my door is always open to them, I'm sure Tim and the Polo Operations, the door is always open. And that's the way you build up a trust and a relationship that then flows into sponsorship and marketing and crowds and they become. I think Polo have done a better job than we have in making stars. I think everybody knows can be asso. You know, he, he's like a... He's a sporting superstar that across disciplines, people know who he is. Sure. And we have the equivalent, you know, McLean Ward, Ken Farrington, um, Ben Mayer. And they're all in the, I mean, in the top five in the world. But we're not, we're not, we have not been as good or the sport hasn't been as good at making them the stars that Cambiasso has. But we have a lot of them. And increasingly, the Wellington public are starting to know who is who. So for the big shows, they know they'll be competing and they all come along. Yeah, yeah, you're sure having that Irish team is doing great this year again. I mean, Shane's having a great season. Dar always has a great yeah. season. Yeah. Um, and and I, I read an article on you uh, to prepare for today. And um, there was a quote from Shane about you. And it was just lovely what he was saying about you. And, and it's obvious that that he has a very close connection to you. And that, that that's what I think the, the viewers and the listeners need to hear about Polo. And, and the equestrian sports we enjoy at Wellington International, there's that partnership, there's that camaraderie. You can't do it in isolation. I mean, you can't do it in isolation, they can't do it in isolation. Absolutely. It's hard to beat the Irish. <laughs> <laughs> I should say that so myself, yeah. <laughs> as, a, as a good Irishman. Yeah, I'm Sicilian. I don't think there's ever been a Sicilian rider <laughs> or polo player, but be that as it may. One of the things that we do to kind of support Michael and their group is we have successfully brought some of the key people. Michael Matz yes. came to our speaker series. He was mesmerizing. He's off the charts, yeah. as, not just as a, a rider, but as a person, as a person. And when people get to meet these guys and find out the guy that trained Barbaro and jumped in the Olympics and pulled people out of a U.S. Airways plane crash and fire, uh, when, when they meet that person and find out how humble he is. And it's the same with Laura Kraut. You know, we had her do a speaker series and, you know, um, we, we are, we are looking because the equestrian community, the jumper community and dressage, they, they outnumber us so much. And we have so much respect for their dedication to their horses that we're trying to bridge this gap and, and, and show that and people, you know, a lot of our members here are from the jumper crowd. You know, a lot of the um, Monday people having yeah. lunch by the pool are all taking, taking. you know, because we have a club here and uh, that's something we can offer for the the uh, the WEF community mm -hmm. is we have a place where you can come and celebrate. We come. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, you know, and that brings up another thought that the players and, and, and the, the riders at Wellington International they're more accessible to the general public than let's say the famous basketball players or baseball players. You know, I could be on a coffee line and have McLean in front of me and it's like, and it's 
it's funny, the same thing with the polo players. They're, they're accessible to the general public. It's not, it's not like they're aloof and, and, you know, untouchable. And, and sometimes in, in the, you know, the format, you know, the major sports, if you will, the basketball, baseball, uh, uh, football, et cetera, it's not so, but, but in this world, it's just, it's different. I think it's a real valuable part of the culture. You know, one of the things that I find about the equestrian community is there's an overall general sense of, uh, humility that people that love animals seem to be a little more grounded um you know i mean feeding a horse and cleaning up a little poop now and then can really humanize the best of us yeah yeah <laughs> if i know that right yes. <laughs> ab- very politically correct yeah. yep, absolutely absolutely um let's talk about little cultures history of uh of polo and uh you know equestrian sports at wellington international the history is a little different. The culture is a little different. Um, let me start with Tim. Uh, what business considerations in the in the business of polo are kind of unique to that business that may not necessarily, you know, apply in dressage or show jumping or hunters? The quintessential difference between polo and all other equestrian sports. Uh, is that polo is the oldest team sport in the world. It's 2,000 years old. And um, I remember I had to speak at Norman Brinker's funeral once and talk about his love of polo. And there were a lot of people in the audience that didn't like polo because it, it, it crippled Norman Brinker and put him in a wheelchair because he had a bad accident. And that's that's part of the sport is the danger side of it. But his what he found from polo and understanding that it's a team effort is what he then applied that to business and brought in teamwork into his business cycle and how he ran all of his business, uh, chili, steak and ale, Bennig, all those. He's the grandfather of casual dining. And he brought this element of teamwork uh, that seemed to be very effective of, of how you can work and putting someone in the right spot on the team is so important and finding a person that's good in the, because each position in polo has a different skill set. Yeah. I remember, you know, we did our last podcast, we were talking about this. There's actually two teams. There's the team of riders and, and, and players, and then the team of each individual horse and rider that I think is, is so unique to the sport. So that team concept is something that I, I know it resonates with the fans. I know it resonates with me. It's, it's just wonderful. And how about you, my friend? Dressage, hunters, eventing, equitation, jumpers, they all have their own kind of different histories and, and culture. And how, do, how does, uh, how, are, are there business issues related to those disciplines that are just different from any other kind of equine sports? I think each each discipline has a slightly different um, business model, if you want to call it that. Um, like dressage is very much um, the people are competing because they want to compete. They don't compete as much. I think the business side of it is probably less. It's it's the training of the horses is the most important business, if you like, element of it. Okay. For show jumping, it's probably the dealing, the buying and selling of the horses. Training is very important, but. Um, the buying and selling. And then eventing is, they have a little bit of training, but eventing is is not very economical for people to do it. So you don't have the same sort of centers like we have here or the size of the sport is much smaller. Driving is very much um, uneconomical. You just want to have a, how do you make a small fortune out of driving? You start off with a big one. Sure. It's really not a very... Uh, and then you have vaulting and endurance riding, which are really just more social sports that are very competitive at the high level, but they're, they're, they're different. And I mean, you know, historically, uh, jumping and dressage have been the, to the forefront. And, and I often use, uh, if I have to give a, a speech or something about, about the horse sport and how it's found, I, I often ask, what was the first uh, competitive horse sport? And they say dressage or whatever. Said no, actually, it was polo, way before anybody else. Yep. Uh, and and I guess you know, when you go to the showgrounds, the first thing everybody thinks of is the Grand Prix horses, the Grand Prix events. That's the the marquee event 
but but those hunter horses they're not cheap <laughs> there's nothing cheap in wellington yeah. <laughs> yeah. cheap but, is not a word that we use very often around no here. no i think it's but i think wellington is good value yes because what you it isn't cheap but what you get is way above i mean where else could you see the olympic champion on a saturday and the top polo rider in the world yeah same weekend same weekend i mean it's i don't think you see that anywhere, yeah. anywhere. one no. mile away from each other yeah it's crazy right yeah. okay so now let's move on to the let's talk about the past versus the future and let's start with michael uh you know you know society evolves over time the world evolves over, over time culture evolves over time what would you say uh how has the business of equestrian sports in your view has, how has it changed or evolved over, let's say, the last 10 years? I think it's grown enormously. The um, the interest in it is what really, um, because we've been lucky in our side of the sport, we've been lucky to have some sort of high profile um, people get involved, you know, whether it's Georgina Bloomberg, uh, Eve Jobs, um, Jen Gates, Jessica Springsteen, all these uh and they're they're top riders. They're not uh, they're not just um, wealthy kids who, without talent and are just competing. These are super talented riders Absolutely. as well. And what they've done is they've driven a lot of other uh, families to look at these families. And say, oh, this is really exciting. This is interesting. Why don't we do it? And so the kids get involved. And once the kids get involved, then the families get involved. And we structured a lot of our competitions over the last ten years to enable um, the mothers and some fathers as well, but mainly the mothers to be able to compete themselves at a very low level. But what, what that has done is it has meant that when uh, a family, maybe they, the kids go to college or they get tired of it or they find boyfriends or they find girlfriends and that they lose a little bit of interest, the parents are still going because they, they really enjoy it now. And so that's been able to maintain the level and the numbers, and that's driven the whole business from hospitality to entertainment, to you na name it. And they all want to stay in Wellington. Yeah, yeah, that that that's for certain. The population here has grown, and for the better, I think. How about you, Tim? I mean, polo has an ancient and wonderful history. Five, ten years ago, how how is it different now? The business of it than it was maybe ten years ago. You know, it's interesting. Um, in some way, polo is the most traditional sport, white pants, you know, um, uh, six chuckers, wrap the horses. It's been played that way for thousands of years and um, and at three o'clock on Sundays all around the world. <laughs> so, um, so in some ways, what's new, it's coming into polo is the search for the great horse. 80% they say is about how the quality of your horse. I'm sure it's the same with jumping um, and dressage. And, and so the search for the horse, the perfect horse is, is, is on. Um, cloning is one of the newest, cloning and breeding. Um, I've actually cloned my dog and I'm very happy really? about that. Yeah, very happy. And it's, it's amazing to see a cloned animal who is identical to the, the the parent or whatever the other person or or whatever Adolfo has cloned uh, fifty of his number one Hortatera his number one horse he's got fifty of them and um, he he can play them all at the same time in Palermo in the in Argentina so cloning is huge it's a big business now um, and it's a big part it's still you know I think polo is a little bit looser when it comes to uh, the rules of what you can and can't do with breeding horses than horse racing and, and some of the other sports, um, cause it's, it's still seen as a kind of a private, you know, uh, elite sport, uh, that, that is done. But so cloning, breeding, um, uh, searching for the great horse and the cost of horses, you know, when I was there, a top horse was 50,000 for a horse and now it's 300 for a top, top horse. Wow. Now. You know, and, and you need, you know, each player needs 20 uh, horses, which is different than the jumping world where three or four and dressage two or three gets you through. 
And that's why there's a lot more people in that world because it's, it's really difficult to keep, um, to keep yourself mounted, as they say, uh, in, in polo. That's the number one challenge for young players trying to move up is to get the quality of a horse they need to compete against these top players. You know, something you both said just, just raised a thought in my mind that I hadn't really considered until now. Um, the use of technology, you know, as things evolve, things change, um, like in my field, in, tr in trial work, in the old days, we'd stand before the jury with an easel and explain things to them. Now there's PowerPoints and all these fancy electronic gizmos that we use to, to put on trials. And, and even though things, you know, in, in the old days, you had to, you know, go to the show office to sign up for events. Now you can do it on your phone and, you know, same thing with polo, but the games haven't changed. And, 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 and I think we love that, that the events haven't changed. You know, that you still have a, you still have a clock that you're going against in a Grand Prix event. Mm -hmm. You know, you hit a rail, you, you, you get a rail, it's still four faults. Polo matches, you know, we still don't allow left-handed people like me <laughs> to play polo. Yeah. I don't know why, but you don't. <laughs> yeah, all the rules are, it would be so complicated to set up a rule book with left-handed players. Yeah. Everything yeah. is based on a right, when you can hook, when you can, you know, swing this side of the mallet and how you bump somebody. It's all based on a right hand. Prince William, um, uh, future king of England, is left-handed and has to play polo with his right hand. So he's... A bit handy. I see. Yeah. But, you know, but when you've been in the horse world, like my wife and I, for 30 years, there's a certain comfort in knowing that it remains the same. The events, the rules, they remain the same. Yeah. Polo remains the same. There's a certain comfort in that. Uh, all right. Let's talk about the future. So let's, and we'll start with Tim this time. Uh, you are synonymous with polo. There's no doubt about that. And what would you like the viewers to know about your hopes and vision for the business of polo, let's say over the next five years? Um, well, I, I would like to see polo expanded into the other parts of the season for us, October, November, December. They are really delightful months. Now, October is a, a wonderful month. June is actually, a, 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 can be a very pleasant month here, May. Uh, so I would like the season to be expanded, uh, more events to come here, um, and I would, but at the same time, I'm a traditionalist and I, I love seeing polo out here. Um, I, 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 I don't look forward to the day when it's turns into so many different events. It's, it's, it loses its identity as a polo facility. So, um, I'm not so much in favor of that, but, but, uh, finding different community uses for your fields off season is something that, you know, we look to, we have this pavilion across the way. And uh, we've opened that to the Chamber of Commerce, the YPO. We did uh, fashion shows and weddings and, you know, incredible amounts of, of things we offer and open it up to, to the public. You know, that is open every Sunday to the public to watch, come watch polo and drink some champagne. I like that. Yeah. That, that, that sounds good to me. How, how about it, Wellington International, Michael? What are you, what are you looking at? What, do you, what are your vision for the next five years? What do you hope happen? We're looking to expand the showgrounds. Hmm. We're, we're sort of at capacity now. So it's not so much that we're going to get a huge number of extra horses. It's, it's to make it more pleasant for the people who are here. There's lots of opposition to us. You know, they built a uh, $500 million uh, horse show in Ocala. There's a nice one, much smaller, but built in Sarasota. So we have lots of opposition because there's so many horses coming to Florida every winter. Sure. But so we don't necessarily want to, you know, bring all a huge number of extra horses. Obviously, a few more wouldn't hurt. But, uh, <laughs> but we want to improve the uh, the quality because at the end of the day, people show with us for this length of time because of the lifestyle. Because they can come to polo on a Sunday, and we try and finish as early as we can on a Sunday to let people come. In the old days, it used to be the Grand Prix were on Sunday competing directly with polo, which was really dumb because... You know, why would you compete for for uh, spectators and sponsors and everybody else? So I think, you know, over the years, we've worked very, very well with Polo to understand, you know, what can we do to make it better? And I think now with Tim's leadership and the leadership of uh, the, the USPA and the, the National Polo Center, I think we're going to work much closer together 
to actually make um, to find out ways that we can benefit each other. And if that's you know more people learning polo, that and then they can stay here for longer, they can show off season, compete off season. It's stuff like that. You know, we want to build a, a better grass field so we can um, compete more in the in the summertime, more shaded structures, stuff like that, yeah. to get more people to come and more importantly, more people to stay on the off season. Uh, the show, just as Tim was yeah. mentioning earlier. And that benefits all of us. It's, sure. It benefits the club here. It benefits us with more entries. And you know, th there is a, a very symbiotic relationship between the two organizations if we, if we approach it in that direction. Uh, you know, the magic of Wellington's the magic of Wellington. And we have a, a show jump, jumper friend of ours who's spending her first season in Wellington this year. She's, she, she competes in California. And she saw my wife at the showgrounds one day. She goes, "This is like. It, it, they have nothing like that in California. It's you know, wow." And then my wife says, "And you can go to polo on Sunday." Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's just, you're right. I mean, both of you're right. It's it's just something unique. It's something we have to preserve. It's something that that I hope has a. I, I know we'll have a great future, and I'm I hope I'm around long enough to see it. <laughs> I'm sure you will be. <laughs> All right, fellas, last question. You've been you've been wonderful. You've been so kind. I know you're both very busy to take time out to, to sit and chat with me today. Tim, if you had to identify one thing, just one, that's most important to you about the sport of polo, what would that one thing be? It would be how we take the sport, the passion, the thrill, and how we imbue that into the hearts and souls of spectators. And we're doing it through better uh, technology. A polo is a difficult sport to watch physically. You need, and when you watch it really on television, it's a lot better, it's easier. The close-ups, the, the drone cameras that now happen right behind the horse and following the hoofs, and uh, it, they, they really ha have made polo an extraordinary ESPN is now here filming our games, uh, put it, bringing television to the mass audience. Um, that's so important. Polo is, is a beautiful sport when you play it. It's thrilling and electrifying, all of that. But for those, we have to make it just as important to watch it. So that's my dream is how do we make this sport the most enjoyable sport to watch and the most electrifying so you feel polo not just that you're under some tent drinking champagne, having a social hour with people, but you feel the sport of polo like we did last Sunday. Yep, absolutely. Okay, Michael, bring us home. If you had to say one thing, your most important thing for you about equestrian sports at Wellington International, what would that be? I think it's the, it's the fact that we have the very, very best riders in the world competing. And you can go to the horse show on a Saturday afternoon for $20 for your car load and you can watch it for free. And I think what, what that has done is it's given an identity to Wellington to be the horse sport capital of the world. And um, I think that's where, you know, if this is one thing that I think is fantastic what we're doing. In the future, I'd like to um, improve the, the visibility of the top riders, make people understand that they are watching the very, very best competitors in the world. And I think we can take a leaf out of Polo's book in the way they've done that. Yeah, yeah. Well, they are the very top riders in the world. We enjoy seeing them. It, it's just wonderful down here. Well, fellas, we made it. <laughs> We're finished. And I want to thank you both again for taking the time that you took with me today. As a full-time Wellington resident and a horse lover myself, I know that the business of Polo and the business of equestrian sports at at Wellington International is in great hands. Thank you. And Thank as, you so as a wise person once said to me, uh, there's been a special relationship between people and horses since there's been people and horses. And that wise man was me. <laughs> <laughs> and love your horses, folks. Uh, we aim to give you the best. Stay tuned for, uh, for our next episode of Minute with Mike podcast. Look for us on Phelps Media, Instagram and Facebook. And we'll see you all next time. Take care.